This is Mandatory Listening. I'm your host, Kent Mann. Each week, we sit down over a cup of coffee and discuss interesting topics in the world of the customer experience. Joined this morning by Tony Tanner. Hello again, Tony. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Is it 821 in your in your part of the world? Yes, it is. So you're up early. Eh, not really not not too early. Are you uh do you roll out of bed before your alarm? Are you enthusiastic to to attack the day? Depends on if I'm in one of these patterns where I don't sleep very well at night. But uh, I mean most of the time sometimes I beat my alarm, sometimes I get up right when my alarm goes off, but um you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm a morning person or an evening person. It kind of really depends on what's going on that day. You know, I do like kind of the time to ease into my day. I don't like being, you know, bombarded or having, uh, you know, a lot of pressure or a lot of things to do, you know, immediately, you know, when I get up or get out of the shower or whatever, I kind of like the opportunity to ease into my day a little bit. Yeah. Are you much of a breakfast guy? Um, small, small breakfast, you know, for, for whatever reason, I don't, my, my stomach doesn't want a lot of food, um, in the morning, especially when I'm going to ride the heat here in Houston. Now, this time of year, I'm, I've, I've got my breakfast pretty much dialed in, but I don't eat a lot for, for breakfast now. Yeah. Well, I know you are probably in the man group, the most enthusiastic coffee drinker on our team. <laughs> Uh, so are you on cup three or four at the moment? Uh, I'm on cup two right now. Cup two. Okay. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you if, if you're going to a nice coffee shop in town, or if you had the perfect coffee set up, what kind of drink would you make yourself every morning? Well, my perfect cup of coffee, uh, or my coffee house is actually here at my house. I mean, um, being the coffee aficionado that I am, uh, or, uh, as some of my friends call me a coffee snob, you know, I've got a, a, a super automatic machine here at home, which basically means it grinds the beans, mixes the water, puts it under pressure. You know, it's a machine that can do either espresso or what I call my perfect cup of coffee is what many people call an Americano, which is just espresso and hot water, but it puts the under pressure, it puts that crema uh, on the top, which is, it's it's one of the reasons why I don't spend a lot of time at coffee houses because I'm like, I kind of like, I kind of like my machine I have here. (laughs) Yeah, I can definitely, uh, I, I, I definitely appreciate my own, uh, coffee most of the time, but there are some, there are some good spots around Asheville that, that do a decent cup of coffee. Oh yeah. I'm really, I'm really partial to a a cappuccino these days. I really have gotten into them recently, especially a dry cappuccino. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and I tend to I tend to like an Americano in the morning and then typically in the afternoon I will I will switch to an espresso. But, you know, if I want something that's, you know, out of the norm or more like a treat, you know, like just like what you're saying is, you know, I will do, you know, I prefer a cappuccino over a latte because I don't put sugar in my coffee and I don't like it overly sweet. Mm, yeah, me me neither. I like the uh, the a, a dark, robust roast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, now that we've uh, you know got everyone's uh, mouths watering for coffee, <laughs> uh, let's get on to the real topic at hand because we are no longer allowed to talk about Game of Thrones. Uh, we are forbidden due to popular request. So no more Game of Thrones talk. Even though we're in the the height of it, oh my gosh, we're well, we're well, a few days from the last episode. From the last episode, but I th- I think all of us, like so many of the fans right now, are a little bit pissed. So I, I'm actually okay with not talking about Game of Thrones today. Yeah, let's not get into that. <laughs> okay, so uh, we wanted to talk to to get your perspective on interviewing, the hiring process in general. Talk to Dan about it. A uh, a few podcasts ago, but just let's do an overview really quick for the man group. You do tons of interviews for, for some of our clients, but you, you know, you don't, you haven't spent a lot of time being interviewed, uh, in the last few years, but what's, what's been your experience conducting interviews over the last few years? That a lot of people are not prepared for our process, uh, of interviewing and how in depth, 
our process is, is I would say is one of the, you know, it's been my experience lately. You know, one of the things I, I really love is when an interviewee says, you know, wow, that's a really gr- great question. And, you know, they pause, you know, for some time to think about and, you know, kind of recalling memories and different things that have happened uh, before they answer that question. But I, I would say that, you know, th- there are a lot of good interviewing processes out there. There are a lot of people out there that are very good at interviewing people. But I've also seen, in fact, just recently, I've also witnessed some very bad interviews as well. Yeah, yeah. go into that really quick. Just uh, some of the problems you've seen on both sides of the table, the interviewing table, just that you've seen recently or that or that came to mind? Well, just in a, a couple of weeks ago, I was here at probably the big mall uh, here in Houston, which is the Galleria. It's one of the best known malls in the entire country. Um, and I actually witnessed two, two different interviews happened at two different times during during my visit. One was actually at the Starbucks there. And then one I just happened to overhear a few things as, as I was walking by uh, as they were sitting outside of a particular store. And what I noticed that were the questions were very on the surface, really just based around, you know, could they meet the qualifications of the job? Could they work the hours? And it was really more focused on, you know, are you excited? Would you want to work here. And what I noticed is that instead of the manager or whoever the person was conducting the interview, then instead of making sure that the candidate convinced them that they were the right person for the job, I noticed that it was the manager trying to sell the interviewee on the job. I I remember when you told me that story the first time, it just revealed to me or evoked an emotion of this person's just hiring out of desperation because I'm just going to convince you as hard as I can to accept this job because I need to fill, uh, fill the spot by Saturday. Yes. I I think it's, it's hiring out of hiring out of desperation as part of it. But I also feel that that person has not been thoroughly trained and doesn't know how to conduct an effective interview and then when, when that happens, and what I saw is that these managers were mistaking enthusiasm for competence. And that's where we be really begin. That's just the beginning of where we, we start to run into trouble. So I wanted to ask, let's, let's just rewind for a minute. And, and I wanted to ask you just in general to overarch this conversation, why is it important that we hire good people in the first place? Why should we spend so much time training, interviewing, getting better at interviewing and, and having a plan and a process for, for hiring in general? Why is it important? And is it worth the investment? Yes. And in many ways, you know, training and developing your people should be your most important investment and having a recruiting interviewing and hiring strategy should also be one of not only given the investment, it should be given its proper place in your daily routine or your monthly routine, however you want to look at it. And the reason why I guess it is so important is because every person that you bring into your organization, they represent everything your organization stands for to your customers. Yeah. And I, I think the, the man group, if I could, if I could condense our philosophy behind this into one phrase that I think Dan has coined in his many years in retail, which is we're always looking for great people mm-hmm. and just having that philosophy of behind interviewing and just saying, you know, we're always accepting applications. We're always looking for people. I'm always trying to get better as an interviewer. It's just a philosophy. Yeah, I'll sit down and talk with you. I'll I'll interview you just to get to know you better. And then I'll keep your application on file. Mm-hmm. So I think just having that upbeat, enthusiastic, optimistic, not desperate approach to interviewing and hiring 
uh, is the key. Of course, yeah. it takes a, some time and, and steps and processes and practice to get to that point sometimes, but it is, that's the end goal. It's, it's really about having, you know, you nailed it there. It's about having a process, but more importantly, it's about having a plan. And for everyone who is listening out there, you know, yeah, I, I get it. Choosing, choosing the right people can be one of the most difficult things we do, but it is literally the beginning of one of the most important things we do because we are choosing the people who are going to represent our organization. And if I can offer maybe a, an analogy for you, and, and I'm talking in the world of you know me being a crazed uh, Oklahoma Sooners football fan, is think about their recruiting plan and their process and their strategy that they have. Like right now, the focus is uh, on the 2020 class, you know, for next year that will sign in, you know, some of them are already, in, you know, signing with the team. Now the early signing day is in, er, is in February. No, excuse me. It's now in, in uh, mid December, but they're also looking at 2021 recruits and even 2022 recruits because they're, they're looking for who's going to be that next great player at any position that is not just going to fill a need on our team, but it's going to be the next difference maker for us. And if we can take that and apply it to our business, it puts us in a much more healthy place is if, if we have a plan and we have a strategy around finding, first and foremost, finding and identifying the right people. And it starts with you as an employer, you as an owner, you as a manager, clearly understanding who it is you're looking for. And what I mean by who is who, what is the type of individual that you are looking for? What are the type of characteristics that you want in each and every person in your organization. It starts there of identifying who is the ideal candidate. Yeah, that's a that's a interesting point of how do you determine the ideal person to work for you? And of course, it starts with something like enthusiasm or it starts with something like, you know, can they work on a bike? You know, if it's if it's you're hiring a mechanic, okay, can they work on a bike? If you're hiring a Salesforce associate, okay, can they start a conversation with someone? Do they have some level of enthusiasm towards getting to know people and asking them questions and and building rapport with someone? Because it's not just they're making sales on a phone call and they don't have to get to know this person at all. They have to sit there and, and shake their hand and introduce themselves. So that certain level of enthusiasm is just is just base. So of course, this this is coupled with with a difficult conversation of just not being too narrow on who you're looking for, but having a, a base standard of you have to have this level of either enthusiasm or competence with uh, bike mechanics or this level of competence with running shoes or, or whatever. You have to have this minimum standard of knowledge. Yes, a, a minimum standard of, of knowledge, but a lot of what's getting overlooked in today's world is can this person, meaning that anyone that you would bring into your organization, can they connect with people, you know, on a personal level, meaning, you know, can they put themselves aside and begin to, can they identify, but can they connect with the needs and wants and can they recognize the needs and wants of the person in front of them, you know, at the customer. So, you know, the, the personal skills, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. And in so many of our industries, you know, we tend to put so much focus on, you know, product knowledge or industry experience. But at the end of the day, this is still a people business and it's people that make it happen. So how do you, how do you get to that point with just several interviews? you know, getting to that point of knowing their commitment level. Like, how do you know if they're going to stay at your company? How do you know 
that this person does have the people skills mm-hmm. in, uh, to, to build a rapport with someone. What do you look for on a resume that, that'll, that'll reveal that? Or what question can you ask? You know, again, first and foremost, it starts with an unwavering knowledge of who it is that you're looking for. You know, what, what are the standards? What are the characteristics you are looking for in someone? And those really need to be non-negotiable. Hmm. But as we, as we say, what you're looking for, you know, on a, on a resume, you know, I kind of look at a resume like a spreadsheet or a sales report or an inventory report. They can only tell you so much and you can't manage your business just by looking at numbers or just by looking at information in front of you. But the key is, is to tie it together is when you're sitting down and you're talking with the person, the past performance is the best indicator, or I should say past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. So how can you find out, you know, how someone will perform in your organization is you dig into their past. You dig into their work history. Mm. Like what sticks out to me is you could have someone who's just a rock star candidate, like this person not, you know, fix or uh, uh, checks off every box. Uh, this is the exact person that I, that I need and they can work soon. And then you look at their past history and they haven't stayed at a job longer than six months. Mm-hmm. That's a huge red flag. So you could have the perfect candidate, you know, that great blend. I think we've mentioned this on a, on a previous podcast, that perfect blend of, of technical skills, people skills, and then that third piece, commitment. Mm-hmm. Do they have that commitment of past behavior? So it's hard to tell if someone's going to, you know, if they're just jumping job to job to find that perfect fit, you know, where they, I'm, I'm using air quotes, perfect fit for them that it's just going to be their dream job. That's great that they're looking for their dream job, but it's not great for you to spend six months training them, getting them up to speed just for them to leave to find the next best opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can they commit to something? Ab- absolutely. And, you know, you can, you can definitely see that, you know, on the resume, but I also then, I want to explore the why, why did they leave these, you know, a particular yeah. job and why are they interested in coming aboard with us, but you know, and what I mean by digging into, you know, their their past performance is, for example, someone can give you, you know, on the resume, and you ask them, you know, so so tell me tell me about your you know your previous job. You say, okay, well, I was a manager of, you know, store X Y Z, and during my time, you know, I increased sales by twenty five percent. I'm like, okay, wow, awesome, great. So, and and in most cases, we take that at face value and we think, oh, wow, I got a manager here or I've got a potential candidate that knows how to increase sales. Awesome. I need somebody right now. When can you start? Instead of when they give you, you know, that fact that I increase sales by 25%. Okay, great. So walk me through the steps that you took or walk me through how you did that. Yeah. And, you know, as as all of us have have done this, we can find out pretty much anything we want to know about a particular candidate with just two or three questions, because you continue to dig. You know, we call it Sherlocking is we don't we don't take things at face value. We actually want to know that, you know, the who, who, what, where, when and why. Yeah, give me details. Give me specifics. Yes. And the person that you're looking for, that that productive employee, you know, the 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 achiever that we're all looking for, you know, the the commitment level to to match the achievement. You have to just ask those those deeper questions that that who 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 was your boss then? How long were they your boss? Did you have a did you have a a, a friendship with them? How did you get to those sales numbers? How did you beat the the monthly sale record at your company. How did you do? When did you do that? How long did it take you? What were your steps? And, and I think if if we can start asking those questions, those deeper, you know, Sherlock type questions, it just gives us so much more meat to work with 
than just those philosophy answers yes. that, that really get us nowhere and, and don't give us that, that past behavior that we're looking for. Mm-hmm. In our search for, you know, in our, our, if our quest, if you will, of, you know, uh, past behavior being the best indicator of future performance, this also emphasizes how important it, it is to have a recruiting strategy and always be looking for great people, whether it is at a restaurant or in another store, or, you know, it could be someone working at the ticket counter at, at the airport, you know, for an airline. I mean, you never know where you're going to encounter that next great person. But what that gives you the opportunity to do is interview someone and they don't know they're being interviewed. And you yeah. can actually see how they perform. Yeah, I, I remember Dan telling me something about that with uh, when he first started at Backrack in the mall. He would go to all the stores nearby and introduce himself to the to either the manager or the person who spent most of their time leading that store, and just say, "Hey, if you." Uh, have any candidates and you're not looking to hire anyone right now, send them down my way and I'll interview them. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you do that with, you know, it's easy in a mall to, to visualize that. Just, you can go to all your nearby, uh, you know, not even competition, but Hey, if you have a great candidate and you're not looking to hire anyone, just send them down my way and I'll have, I'll be happy to interview them. That's just networking between professionals. Networking between professionals, but where that is a great opportunity, but, especially in specialty sports where the danger can be with that is we think that we can only hire people who have industry experience. And the reason why so many people do that is because they think this person can, I'm using air quotes here, hit the ground running and I can plug and play. But the danger of doing that is you're now bringing someone into your organization that is doing things the way they were taught by someone else. Yeah, in a competition, uh, you know, if it's like from a bike store to a run store or an outdoor store to a run store or something like that, it, it reduces that slightly, but not completely. Because it's still a sales process. How do you, you know, how do you approach a customer? How do you recommend items to a customer? How do you deal with the changing room? Oh, at my old shop, we used to do it like this. Okay, that's great. That's your old shop, uh, but this is this shop, and so that can that can become a a red flag. So so how do you? Yeah. So not being industry specific in terms of criteria for employees, and that one, I want to lead that right into uh, w- one of our last topics of just the overarching subject of planning for seasonality. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is a lot of our listeners or, or people that we work with are extremely seasonal. Like their, their employees will sometimes, or their employee size will sometimes double during their on season, especially the ski, uh, more winter sports um, segment and, and in summer, of course, too. So, these people or these companies that ha- no matter what have to hire sometimes 20 or 30 people in a month or two, what is the plan for conducting those interviews still in the same process so that way you're not just letting your sales floor go lax during the busy season because you're just, you just can't train these people because you just have to, you literally have to hire out of desperation. Yes, but well, it is again having a plan and yeah. You know, I challenge them or I I challenge anyone is that every year, you know, when your busy season is, you know, exactly in many cases to the date of when you have to have these people up to speed and on your sales floor and or in your company. So you need to have a plan for that, that you begin executing. And if you need more time to interview these people. If you need more time to train and develop these people and get them up to speed, then you have to plan for that accordingly and not wait till the last minute or put it off until because you can't hire 20 people and train them and get them up to speed 
two weeks or a month before your busy season starts. So you have to have a plan. And the thing about seasonal people is that where we have to have a paradigm shift in how we think about this is your customer doesn't care if the person in front of them is a seasonal person and it's their first day back or it's a veteran person that's been with the company for 10 years or if it's the owner of the business, the customer doesn't care. The customer still has the same expectation of can this person deliver the experience that I am looking for? Yeah, that's a great point because often we get stuck in this world of, oh, it doesn't matter. They're not going to be here the full year anyway. I'm not paying them that much. Uh, so it's just a low risk employee. Uh, no, absolutely not. This person is even more directly involved with the customer uh, than you are potentially depending on their hours in the in the season. Mm-hmm. So they are, I mean, if it's, if it's 35, you know, 20 to 30 hours a week, that's 20 to 30 hours a week that they are giving a potentially horrendous experience to your customer and alienating them in your most crucial time of the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they could be costing you more business than they are actually bringing in. Yeah, so I, I believe that the plan is uh, several months in advance, you're sending out emails, you're calling back up with your your year-over-year people that come back, whether they're high school or college, they come back for the summer or, or whatever. Uh, you're getting those people, the, the likely returners, you're getting that done early. Mm-hmm. So you get, you reach out to them, you get a confirmation, Hey, you're going to be working with me this summer. Fantastic. Uh, here's what's changed over the, in, in the off season, get you up to speed in the next few months before you start. I want you to, you know, know this product knowledge and just send that as a group email to all your returners. Mm -hmm. Then for the people, okay, I need to fill 10 more slots of people of part-time interviews. Then you start those then you know, several months in advance or start bringing in candidates, start pulling out the, uh, the resumes, uh, that you've acquired over the year. If you've, if you've done your job right. And then that's when you start, all right, let's whittle this down to a warm, warm lead that we want to pursue another interview with. Mm -hmm. And have you, you know, I, I know we've said this many times, but you know, how you are, how you treat and how, how you, develop your people, you know, it says a lot about your business as a whole. And part of that is also, are you treating people, your seasonal people, your part-time people in a way where they would want to come back to you season over season, you know, while they're in high school or while they're in college, or, you know, maybe they just want to work some, you know, some extra hours during the busy season. And, and, you know, there's no, there's no, one right plan for everyone. But again, you know, when your busy season starts, you know, when you need more people, yep. it's your responsibility and your team's responsibility to plan for this accordingly so that you are not, so that you're ready and you're not behind the eight ball, if you will. Yep. Absolutely. And just the, you know, the, we talked about the potential uh, downsides of uh, not hiring people, especially, you know, in in the busy season when you need good people and you're, and you're behind the eight ball on that. But just think of, besides just the negatives, think about the positives of having a full busy season of, of a team full of absolute rock stars. You, you lined them up perfectly during your, your pre busy season and they just all came together, and now you've got a sales floor full of part timers that really like working for you, and that are really uh, making good money uh, uh, for the company, as opposed to just you know last weekend hire sixteen year old fresh out or uh, you know fresh during the summer, just not productive employee basically. Yeah, and Kent, it it all points back to one thing, and that is the cold hard truth and reality. And the lack of the, the lack of a recruiting, interviewing, hiring, and training strategy is leading to this big problem. And that is every single day, every retailer out there, you are missing anywhere between 10 to 60% of the business 
that you could already be doing, meaning you're losing the business, you're losing that percentage of business that's already coming in your door yep. because your people aren't prepared and they don't have the skills to capture that business. Yep. I and can't. Uh, to exactly. me, that's the most simple way of why your people are your most important asset. You should devote the time, energy, and resources to making sure that they can deliver the experience that the customer standing in front of them wants. Absolutely. Well, that was a good, uh, that was a good topic, Tony. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. I'm pleased with, uh, with, with where that went. So I think the, the takeaways for this one is to just to, to remember the pitfalls of potentially hiring the wrong person for an entire busy season out of desperation. Having the the top of mind of hiring is important to our company. Me getting better at interviewing is important for the company. It is a skill, a highly developed skill. Asking great questions is a highly developed skill. And, and being able to build rapport uh, with my staff year over year, whether they're part-timers or full-timers, is crucial for the profitability of your company. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you're looking for growth, mm -hmm. have um, a plan, and, and you know, just, yeah, have, have a plan. And then it allows you to execute that plan, you know, to some degree on a daily basis. And it makes your life so much more, it's so much easier versus having to wait until the last minute and you're under the gun and you can't find people. And now you're stuck. Yep. And you're stressed and angry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Tony, it's always a pleasure. I, um, you know, maybe in a few months when we get you back on again, or maybe in a few weeks, we can uh, safely talk about Game of Thrones without any spoilers. And maybe we can dedicate an hour to that. Yeah. It, it all depends on how this last episode goes. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, looking forward to it. All right, man. Appreciate you joining. Thanks, Kent. Yep. Bye-bye. That's it for this episode. If you like what you hear, subscribe and leave a review on our iTunes channel. We'll see you next week.